Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to the STEM Power Women Podcast. I'm your host, Brittany A.J. Mariki, the founder of Sisters in STEM. If you're new to our audience and don't really know who we are, Sisters in STEM is a multimedia platform aimed toward empowering women of color in their daily lives and their passion for science, technology, engineering, and math. I created this podcast to showcase empowered women, STEM-powered women. Today, we're going to talk about one of the many non-traditional career paths you can take with your STEM degree. It's for those of you who spent years learning about engineering and chemistry and suddenly realized this ain't really for me. You love the concepts, but you rather apply them in different ways. Don't worry, there's still something out there for you. You may not have known that in order to become a patent attorney, you're required to first obtain an engineering, technical, or science degree. We're going to learn more about this from IP law and patent attorney, Andrea Hintz Evans Esquire. She's going to share her journey and a few tips on how you can protect your ideas. You know, the latest and greatest invention or app idea that's been bubbling in the back of your mind. (laughs) So let's get to it. Say hey, sis. Hey, Brittany. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Thank you so much for joining me. (laughs) Thank you for having me. I love this STEM powered. I love it. Yes. (laughs) And you are the definition of STEM powered because you have that STEM background, but you're applying it in such different ways. So I wanted to get to know a little bit about what your journey has been, because just a little tidbit on my part, my mom tricked me into becoming an engineer because I originally thought I wanted to be a lawyer. And she was like, well, if you go get your engineering degree first, you can become a patent attorney. I was like, oh, oh my God, that that sounds awesome. But not many people know that that's a path that you can actually take. So I'm curious, what, what's your career journey been like? Let's walk through it. Well, I was going to say, do our mothers know each other? (laughs) Because uh, I actually did not know about patent law until I got to law school, believe it or not. So just kind of stepping back, when I grew up in Houston, I love the People's Court. I love Judge Wapner. And in third grade, I just set my heart and hopes on becoming a judge. And I wanted to be a TV judge. Now, I was that child that was always advocating for everyone, and I knew I had to be a lawyer first. So I said, okay, I'm going to be a lawyer, and then I'm going to be a judge. Well, I was always good at science and math, and I grew up in a house full of scientists and engineers, and I was always encouraged to push and do STEM activities, and we had robots and different things. And when it was time to go to college, I wanted to go to Spelman. And it was time to choose a major. And my mother's a civil engineer. And she said, well, you're good at math and science. And just in case you change your mind and you don't want to go to law school, you should pursue engineering. And so I actually had a full tuition academic scholarship from Spelman, for Spelman in Georgia Tech. I was in the five-year dual degree engineering program. So NASA paid for my education, thankfully. And I was able to go to Spelman for three years and Georgia Tech for two years. And I graduated with a math and engineering degree. Now, I still wanted to go to law school. So after graduating from college in Atlanta, I figured all lawyers go to D.C. So I knew a few of my classmates who had gone to GW Law School. GW is one of the top law schools in the country. And I was very fortunate to be accepted and attend GW. And while I was there, my professors encouraged me. They said, hey, this is the number one school for intellectual property law. You're here and you're eligible. You actually have a STEM background. You have an engineering degree. I started taking the classes, fell in love with it, and the rest is history. Wow. That's amazing. I didn't even realize that they had that program where you can get that dual degree by going to, so did you get end up with two bachelors when you went to Spelman and then Georgia Tech? Yes, yeah, so it was a five-year program, and you go to Spelman three years, you transfer over to Georgia Tech, and I literally graduated in May from Spelman and June from Georgia Tech. So I was the last <laughs> class to graduate from Georgia Tech on the quarter system. So it was really interesting going from a semester college to the quarter system, but I did it. <laughs> <laughs> I bet that sounds really challenging. <laughs> But that's cool. And that it was funded through NASA. So you didn't have to worry about student loans because of that. No student loans for undergrad. And not only that, it was an amazing opportunity because 
NASA also gave me a summer internship that was paid in Houston at Johnson Space Center. So every summer I was able to go home, earn money, and have a good job, you know, and, and good experience. And I actually loved engineering, and I actually planned to go to law school to pursue environmental law. Um, but once I learned about patent law, which is so ironic, and that's why I love interviews like this, because I didn't even know about patent law until I got to law school. So someone may be listening, and it may be an opportunity for you to actually aspire um, to be a patent attorney. I had never heard of a patent attorney or didn't understand what they did, and now here I am, world-renowned um, as a patent attorney. <laughs> Wow. So did it ever cross your mind, like while you were getting your engineering degree to go pursue a traditional engineering role? Because you had the experience working at NASA in, um, in that, you know, that environment. Did you ever say, oh, OK, well, I'll just leave alone the the law passion and go just the traditional route? No, I, I loved engineering. I will say I actually had a great time at Spelman, a fabulous time at Georgia Tech. And I was very passionate about the environment. So while I was in undergrad in Atlanta, I did a lot of community service and I would go to underserved communities. And I learned that just because they didn't know, they had people come and dump trash in their backyards to build barriers when it would flood. And those mm -hmm. neighborhoods had more chemical plants where those individuals had cancer, you know, and their kids were being born with these deformities. So mm -hmm. I challenged myself to go to law school because I thought I would be an environmental lawyer and go back to these communities and use my engineering degree to redesign the city, you know, as well as be this environmental champion. And when I got to GW, I did take several environmental law classes, but fell in love with intellectual property. And after graduating from GW, I decided to start my career at the Patent and Trademark Office. And that's where the magic happens. That's where patents are um, issued. That's where trademarks are issued. And I was just very fortunate to work there for five years on both sides as a patent examiner and a trademark examining attorney and had a great time and uh, stepped out on faith after five years. And here we are today, about 13 years later, owning the law firm of Andrea Hintz Evans. Wow, that's awesome. So that makes sense why you started with civil engineering, because you, I'm guessing your concentration must have been um, like environmental. And then you were thinking that, okay, I'll use this knowledge and apply it to the environmental law. Okay, that's really cool. That's really but, cool. But you know, that's the beauty of law, though. The beauty of engineering um, for all the STEM people that are listening is, you know, we have a certain way of thinking. You know, you know that there is a definitive answer when you are solving a problem, especially math. You know, you know that you can put something in an equation and get an answer and find a solution. With law, I had to retrain myself because <laughs> the answer is it always depends. And you go from problem solving to reading, you know, a lot of reading, a lot of writing. And I really didn't have a real role model uh, because everybody in my family were engineers, so I didn't really have a lawyer role model to say, hey, what should I expect? I just knew that that's what I wanted to do and just kind of persevered, persevered and uh, pushed myself, and I did it, you know, and I love what I do, uh, but every day I still use my STEM background um, to help people with their inventions. Wow, that's really cool. So what is the, um, the application of that engineering to helping people with those patents? Well, so everything starts with a good idea, but in order to have something that's patentable, you need to be able to describe it in a way that someone can actually make or use the invention. And so, mm. as you know, everybody can think of a good idea, but they don't know how to do it. So how do I make this move or, you know, how does this work? And so as an engineer, when you have a consultation, you need to be able to describe something to me in a way that someone can make or use it. And my job as a patent attorney is to do that research to determine if it's patentable, but then based off of that research, write a good, pat a good strong patent application for you. And so in order to do that, I have to understand how the invention works. So I'm always using my engineering degree every day as people come to me with a range of inventions from things ranging from a simple widget to, you know, complicated inventions for big <laughs> Fortune 100 corporations. 
Wow. Okay. <laughs> that makes sense because if you stereotypically think about an engineer, they're not great with their words. They're great with the numbers, but you understanding both sides of it, you're able to understand what they mean with their invention, but then translate it in a way that can say, okay, this is what they're trying to do in layman's terms. I'm, I'm laughing because it's funny you say that because I know that I'm not the typical engineer and I know that I'm not the typical patent attorney, but I'm just very fortunate to have been blessed with a good personality and a good way of explaining things. So that's actually what I'm known for. I speak around the country about intellectual property and I get a lot of awards and accommodations for being able to explain things in a way that everybody can understand it. So that's what the key is. And so often people have these good inventions and they say, oh, my patent attorney wrote this application. I don't know what any of this means. And I'm always thinking, well, it's your invention. So if you can't read the patent application and understand what it is, then the patent examiner's not going to understand it. So you may have a problem. So that's why I'm very passionate about telling people about this because they think it's complicated. But the hardest thing is to invent something. So once you invent it, you find a good attorney like myself to help you protect it. You do the hard part because you invented it and you get out there and market it and go from there. Protection is important, but you have to make sure you're working with someone that definitely understands what the invention is and you're on the same page. So that's really the most important thing about hiring a good patent attorney, that they understand what your invention is and they can describe it and they can describe it so that someone can make it or use it. And most importantly, they can describe it to hopefully get you a patent. That's the ultimate goal. Okay. So what I'm hearing is that the key skills, someone who's considering this type of path would be like having pers a, you know, positive personality traits, being able to have good communication skills, to um, relay that message to get their client and others who would be interested in, you know, um, buying it or the, you know, the other lawyers who are trying to help them protect it. And let's see, you know, problem solving skills. Sounds like a, a lot of common skills that we all would, would have. So it, there's no limitations. Everyone seems right. like they could take that route if they're willing to handle it. So what are, what are the steps to actually like obtaining your law degree? Because I know when I think law school, I think, okay, that's a long time. <laughs> Well, but you know, here's one thing that people often overlook. So there's what's called a patent agent and there's what's called a patent attorney. So the difference is that the patent attorney not only passed the patent bar that's hosted by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, but they also passed a state bar and went to law school. So let's say people are watching and they say, you know, I'm not interested in going to law school, but I like patents. So if that's the case, you actually qualify for the patent bar exam. You can sit and take the exam, and once you pass it as a patent agent, you're then authorized to be able to write patent applications on behalf of others. So you don't oh. actually have to go to law school to actually write and prosecute patent applications. Now, the beauty of having that law degree is, of course, now you're a lawyer, so you can litigate if you need to. Uh, but if you are just interested in writing applications and doing things before the Patent and Trademark Office, you actually don't have to go to law school. So for people listening, if they want to start studying and looking into taking the patent bar, you're eligible if you have um, the engineering degree or a certain number of STEM credits that you've taken in college. So maybe something you want to look into. It's a very lucrative career, and it's very rewarding and a lot of fun, you know, to see somebody go from an idea – literally on a napkin to the store shelves or Shark Tank. It's so amazing how you just come up with this great idea to solve a problem and so many people have the same problem. And what I always say is the difference between someone making a lot of money on their idea versus someone who doesn't is that they took action. So the hardest thing is to take action. People have great ideas and just sit on them. So you have to take action. That That's really interesting that you say that. So I know you mentioned that it's you have the engineering degree or if you have a certain number of STEM credits. So that means that you don't necessarily have to be an engineer to go that route. You can have chemistry credits or biology credits and apply it in however way that they see fit and then go for their patent agent or patent attorney? 
Yeah, so um, look into the exact number, but if you go to USPTO.gov, they do have a list of the number of credits. Um, and then it's obvious, like, if you have a certain degree, you automatically qualify. Mm. Okay. But I know several people who have liberal art degrees who want to get into this field, and they go back and take the number of classes that are needed, um, and you don't actually have to have a degree, just so many credits and a certain number of STEM classes, and they take that exam to pass the patent bar so that they're patent agents. So it is possible that people mm -hmm. even take it while they're in undergrad. So you're mm -hmm. not required to actually have a degree. Oh, see that even that just reframes the game because that means you could be in school right now, have already completed like your first two years or something. Let's say that those that's what the requirements are and start writing patents on the side as like a side hustle while you're trying to get the degree. <laughs> yeah, and you know, what I learned when I got to law school, because like I said, I didn't know about this, but there are engineering companies that are so desperate for patent agents and patent attorneys to work for them that they'll actually pay for you to go to law school. So mm. if you're an engineer, there are different programs at, at different companies, and you know, there's so many opportunities, and I'm glad we're doing this, because like I said, I didn't know about it, so... Um, mm -hmm. Now you may know and say, hey, I'm going to look into that. You can fund law school without having any student loans. So that's amazing. Yeah. So I'm curious, how does um, how does that work? How are you benefiting that law firm and them paying for you to, you know, get your law degree if you're uh, is that already at the point you're a patent agent and you're able to do that, but then they're paying for you to go to law school so you can become a patent attorney? Or I'm trying to see how the, it, you can, it, it's a mutually beneficial relationship. Well, because those companies need patents and to have someone to work in house that, you know, has their best interest at stake is key, you know, to not have to outsource uh, just like any business. So to not have to outsource something to someone to pay them and keep everything in the house is going to ultimately save them money. And so mm -hmm. I've seen where people are engineers that work at a big company and the company will say, okay, we'll pay for you to take the exam. So go and become a patent agent. And then I've seen where they say, look, you know, we have a program where we're looking for patent lawyers and maybe you have to work for that company for so many years, but there are a lot of options. Um, okay. and you determine that that's what you want to do, you know, definitely do your research and do your homework, but there are opportunities available. Okay. That's cool. So do you have any tips for people who would take that extra step uh, that are, you know, taking that extra step to go past the bar? Hey, you know, hard work pays off. So you have to put in the hard work, um, what you're doing. So if, if you're watching this and you're STEM powered and you're into STEM, um, it's imp it's not impossible, right? Like when people hear science and math and engineering, they get those knots in their stomach and they feel like, oh, this is so hard. I hate math. And they start saying all these negative things about math. It's doable, especially if you have the right person to guide you and instruct you and encourage you. And so if you've made it through those STEM classes, it's anything's possible as far as I'm concerned. So um, I would just say continue to do the hard work that you did to pass all those engineering classes and those science classes and just uh, do what they say in law school. And once you actually get out of law school, you have to work hard to pass that state bar. It's the same thing. So every day, even owning my law firm, I'm learning new things and I'm just constantly giving it 110% every day. And so the benefits outweigh anything, you know, the risk for sure. <laughs> now I'm curious about the bar exam itself, because in engineering and just STEM in general, there's always, you know, like you said, there's some usually a finite answer or they're trying to trick you and into you getting to that finite answer. Um, with the bar exam, is it just straightforward? Okay, this is this law, what does it say? Or is it saying this, Susie wants to do this and Mark wants to do that. How do you do it? <laughs> Well, it's, it's a little bit of both. You know, it's kind of what you see on TV. It's a lot of that. And we know from just everything that's going on in the media today that the law is not black and white, you know, and it's up to you as a lawyer to interpret that, you know, to the best of your ability on behalf of your client. And so what they teach you in law school is they teach you the law, but they teach you more importantly how to interpret the law and how to 
um, come up with a conclusion. So you're often called on in class um, to summarize a case that you've read, you know, that was required for your homework, but then to analyze that case, just like you said. So what happens if, um, what is the, the rule out of this case? Okay, this is the rule. So if this happens, is this person innocent or guilty? What are the causes of actions? It, does it say maybe? Does it, you know, this is when words are important and words matter. Uh, but that's what they teach you in law school, how to think and most importantly, critical thinking skills. And so that's what you learn um, and have to kind of retrain yourself from going from problem solving, which is still solving problems just in a different way, you know, not with a, not with a formula and numbers. It's more fact patterns. But, you know, like anything, you have to love it. And I knew at an early age that that's what I wanted to do. So I was just happy to be in D.C. and <laughs> happy to be in law school and just felt like, hey, I'm on my way to accomplishing the goal that I set my heart out on as young as, as third grade. <laughs> and when you're in law school, you have to learn the law in general because you could be called upon for a little bit of everything. Even though you want your main focus to be patent law, you could be, you, you may need to be used for, for other purposes. So am I, am I right or am I, um, or am I just fishing here? <laughs> well, um, just similar, just like doctors, we, they have specialties. And so as a lawyer, we have our specialties as well. Uh, but a good lawyer knows how to interpret the law. So I, hey, getting a divorce and helping you get a divorce is not my expertise, but I'm sure I could research it and I can understand the rules, but it's kind of like, I love what I do and I have this specialty in this patent trademark and copyright area. So um, you find something that you love and, you know, pursue it. And so what I'm pursuing is intellectual property law, but the beauty of law school is it does teach you general concepts, you know, general laws, and then you go and study for the bar in your state and you have to learn the state laws and apply the rules, you know, in your state. Uh, to be able to answer questions. But what I do is actually federal. So another good thing about intellectual property is my clients are all over the world. And so, you know, you talk about job security, it's amazing because people are inventing, people have brands that need protected all over the world. And I don't physically have to be where they're located because the type of law that I practice is what's called federal law. So it's, it's really a fun an amazing field and especially using technology, um, anything's possible. The patent office is set up where everything is filed electronically anyway. So it's a lot of um, good, hard work, but it can be done from anywhere. Okay, because when you have a patent, it's not just protected in your singular state, it's protected overall within the nation. And then as you're saying, around the world as well. So if you file well, a patent- around the world, you have to get a patent in every country. So that's one of the Ooh. myths of patents. So um, there are different applications that you can file to hold your date in those other countries, but every country does have their own intellectual property laws. Okay, that makes sense. Now, since we've been talking about it a whole lot, we should have broke it down to say, what exactly is a patent? <laughs> so that way people know, what what am I trying, like, how am I protecting this? What, what exactly is a patent? <laughs> well, patents protect invention. So just stepping back even further, intellectual property is divided into patents, trademarks, and copyrights. And so patents protect inventions, trademarks protect the names of those inventions, and copyrights protect written work. So you're gonna patent the television, trademark Sony, the brand name of that television, and copyright scripts for your television show. So that's why I love intellectual property because everyone has some type of intellectual property. The name of your podcast can be trademarked. The content of these videos and publications that you're out here making, those should be protected with the copyright. The notes that people are taking as they watch and listen to this um, podcast can be protected with the copyright. So everyone has some type of intellectual property. So I'm curious because, and I say I'm curious a lot because I'm always, I'm curious about something. I'm an inquisitive person. <laughs> um, when you have written something, don't you automatically get a copyright 
on your works because it's your work. It it's I don't know if it's something like a common law copyright or for using it for so much time uh, because I've I've done a, like a little bit of googling <laughs> and you know Google can only tell you so much. <laughs> Yeah, you're going to have to get my books. I wrote um, two best-selling books all about inventing, everything you need to know about inventing from a former USPTO patent examiner and patent attorney. And then I also authored all about trademarks, everything you need to know about trademarks from a former USPTO trademark examining attorney. And so those are good resources because just like you said, there's so many different myths and misconceptions and people know just enough to be dangerous and google is not your lawyer right google does not have the right information and so many people say oh well, i mailed myself this and you know and i'm always saying if it were that easy there wouldn't be attorneys but to answer your question as soon as you put the pen to paper you do own the copyright so you technically own the copyright as soon as you write something it's yours but in order to enforce that copyright you have to have it registered with the Library of Congress. And so if you have that mm. copyright registered before someone infringes or takes it from you, you get more damages than you would have if you wait. So you have this podcast and someone copies this interview and they go post it on their website. You're scrambling now to pay extra to expedite the copyright application to get that copyright registered before you can file any lawsuit against that person. Okay, now this sounds a little complicated because you would you would go and c try to copyright every single episode of your podcast? Well, maybe, um, or you have seasons. I mean, that's when you would need to sit down and have a consultation to figure it out. But um, copyrights, unlike trademarks, are not examined. So when you file a copyright at the Library of Congress, they're not listening to it saying, oh, this sounds like Andrea's podcast, or I think she copied it. When you file a trademark, they're actually researching to say, oh, the name of her podcast is Brittany uh, with a Y. I found a Brittany with an IE and they may reject it. You know, so um, it's a strategy that you have to have, but you have to look at your intellectual property just like what it is. It's property. So whatever you can do with real property, like your home, you can do with intellectual property. So you can license it, assign it, sell it, will it. And it's extremely valuable. So. I like to tell people to be more proactive than reactive. You know, don't wait for somebody to take something from you to scramble to say, okay, now I need to get this protection. It's better to have it and then pull it out and use it as a sword if you need to, to fight people off instead of scrambling to try to, you know, pay people off to get your name back or to you know, own something that's yours. And with patents, you can even jeopardize your rights. So, it's the first to file a patent application. So if you're sitting on something and someone beats you to the filing, even if you can say, hey, I invented that before this person, if they file it before you, that's it. You know, So people call and say, oh, I've had this invention for 20 years and finally got the courage to tell you about it. It's like I'm holding my breath because it's 20 years and technology is evolving. People are solving problems every day. So you have to act on these ideas. And my, my trademark is invest in your ideas. So you have to take advantage of the law and, and use it, you know, to, for your benefit. Mm. See, so how you're saying it is someone could have invented time travel long ago <laughs> and they've been keeping it a secret, but the person who actually invents it and brings it out to the world and patents their idea is the one who's going to be credited as the actual inventor. Well, the other thing, though, is some things are prior art. So let's say somebody's listening and they say, OK, I did invent this 15 years ago and I've been selling it. So. If you've done something before someone files an application and it's out there and it's in the public domain and people can see it, that's prior art. So that can be cited against you. So you can't mm. say, oh, nobody ever patented this rap that I saw in Mexico. So I'm going to run over here and try to patent it first. Someone already invented that, you know, so you can't patent it. So let's talk about that, because when you have an in invention and I say invention and not an idea, because remember, you need to have more than an idea. You need to be able to describe it in a way that somebody can make or use it. To have mm -hmm. something that's patentable, though, the invention needs to be useful and solve a problem. So that's straightforward. That's why you invented it in the first place. You're trying to solve some problem. But then the invention needs to be novel or new. And so if something is identical, 
you already know it's not patentable. So you're smart enough to say, oh, I, I saw this on TV and now I want to patent it. Well, it, it's identical. It's the same thing. So it's not patentable. Now, the third standard, though, where you really need an attorney to help you is the obvious standard. So would it be obvious to one of ordinary skill in the art to take what's out there and combine it to make your invention? So changing the size, changing the shape, changing the color, those are obvious things, you know, so that means it's not going to be patentable. But what they do at the patent office, and, you know, because I was an examiner, the way it works is they take things and try to pull them together. So you said earlier, um, everybody has come up with, you know, taking something that exists and improving it. And so the improvements have to be patentable. It has to meet those three standards. So would it be obvious to take the handle off of the door and put it on my purse to carry it? You know, it's different things you have to look at, but that's the interpretation. And 90% of patent applications are rejected when you file them. Mm. Um, but just because they're rejected doesn't mean you won't get the patent. It's just the nature of the patent office. So that's why it's important when you have a good idea. You know, it always intrigues me how people have what they say is the next best million dollar idea. And they're trying to do all this on their own because mm -hmm. you can jeopardize your rights. You know, you can file something and get the right filing date and, you know, have a stamp that says you're patent pending, but that doesn't mean anything. It may not even be worth anything. So to me, if you have the next best idea, you're saying it's the next million dollar invention, it's definitely worth investing in hiring a professional to help you for sure. And I agree. And there's a monetary value attached to all of these filings. So if you file your, you pay the money, file your patent, and it comes back rejected, do you have to pay all over again to file again? And how, how much are we talking? Because this is how it gets pricey. <laughs> it's relative though, because if you have a million dollar idea and you're spending a few thousand dollars, it's worth the investment. And so that's why I work in stages at my firm. So you come and say, okay, I have something. Let's have a consultation, discuss it, and see during a brief search if it's patentable. Sometimes during that consultation, I find the invention. We know it's not patentable. We stop there. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes I may say, look, let's do a professional search and make sure that this invention is really going to be patentable because once you file, you're waiting almost two to three years before you hear anything. So most wow. people want to sit for two to three years on an idea and this invention, they want to move on it. And so while your application is pending, you don't have any protection. So you can only stop someone from making or using your invention if you have a patent. So just putting it out there and filing something and saying you're pending is just that because there's no guarantee that that will actually turn into a real patent. Mm. So you want to make sure that you know, you're taking the right steps to do it. Now, when you file, um, you don't get a refund from the patent office for sure. But the worst thing that could happen is you can jeopardize your rights. So your own application can be prior art against you. So you may file it and wait too long. If it's over a year, it's too late. So now you can't call me today and say, I filed something two years ago. Well, you put it out there two years ago. So now it's too late to file a new application. Mm. So let's take um, a real life example. Um, Felicia Leatherwood's brush. She's Issa Rae's hairstylist. She's had a brush out there in the market for years. I don't know what her patent status is or anything, but it's a brush that basically it, when you um, brush through your hair, the pieces move along with your hair to catch the kinks and curls and uh, you know get all the knots out. But mm -hmm. Recently, just within just this past year, I saw so many generic, um, not like, cause you know, Instagram ads, they, they're like, oh, this person probably has natural hair. Let's send them all those ads. And mm -hmm. I saw about three different companies advertising for that same brush. And I know she put out a video saying, I see y'all trying to steal my idea, but this is, you know, this was mine <laughs> to begin with. So if she never filed the patent and well, or if she filed that patent, and had started selling it within that um, that period of time. And then these people come along and they're trying to do the same thing, but with a slightly different shape. How do you get protection on that? Because, you know, it, within that two year span of time, you know, you want to make a little bit of money off of something that you know would be revolutionary to everyone, but someone else could come along and just take, you know, change this, the brush shape just a little bit and then 
it's taken away from your audience? Um, not necessarily. So that's why you need a good patent attorney because there are two types of patent applications. So one is a design. So in the case of a brush, let's say she just wanted to go for the look of it. So you say, I have the best design. So you come to my firm and say, look, I know a chair has four legs, but I'm going to make all my legs look like snakes. So that's a design. <laughs> still four legs. It's still going to support you. It's not functioning or doing anything. So we take pictures of the chair legs and you only get a patent on the look of those legs. So that's when it's sort of infringement in the sense that if somebody makes something that looks like your invention, you can enforce it. So that's what a design patent does. But a utility patent is where you come in and you have a chair with four legs and those snakes take your blood pressure. So you push a button and they make a noise if you sit down too long. So now it's doing something. So when we describe that as a patent attorney, we're not going to ever call those legs that look like snakes because now you're limited. So mm -hmm. it's hard to kind of talk about things in a hypothetical way, but that's why you need a professional to help you so that mm -hmm. you can try to write the application as broad as possible. And then infringement isn't saying, oh, somebody changed the shape a little bit or they changed the color. That's how people think on social media. And that's why there is so much infringement because people don't understand intellectual property. So they'll say, oh, well, the name of my podcast is Andrea. And you say, oh, well, I like that name, too. I'm going to call mine my Andrea. And then they say, oh, but I put the word my in front of it. That doesn't change the commercial impression. That's for trademarks. So then we look at an invention and somebody says, oh, well, yours is pink and mine is red. You know, it doesn't matter. You have to look at the patent that you got and look at the claims and compare the claims to the real invention. But if you don't have a patent and all you have is something pending, um, you don't have anything to enforce. So the worst thing I hate to hear about stories like that is when people do have something and they get out there and they sell it and they're making millions. And then when it is knocked off, they say, oh, now I need to go file a patent for it. It's too late. Mm, because yeah. It's probably past a year. You only have one year once you disclose something to file a patent application or it's considered giving away to the public. So you can't just sit on these ideas. And then not to mention someone with the sense to patent it could have patented it because now the law says it's not the first, it's the first person to file it, not the first person to invent it. So you can't say, oh, well, I invented this first. Here's my proof. It's whoever gets it in first. So that's why you got to get things done and, and treat your business like a real business. So don't wait for someone like Oprah to say your name to say, oh, now I have something. I better get this protected. I'd rather you protect things as you come up with it and, and it, helps because you believe in yourself. So if you believe in something and you believe you have the next best thing, then do it right. You know, treat it like a real business and hire the right people to help you. Interesting. So when it comes to, cause we've been, when I think of inventions, I think of, let's say the brush or you say a chair. Um, what about something that's not physical? It's all, you know, internet based, you have an app idea or you have, you know, the next best thing within the web. Is that, you know, fall within the patent laws as well? Absolutely. So software can be patented and you don't patent the code, you patent the method of doing something. So again, mm -hmm. the method of conducting a podcast interview comprising step one, step two, and you go through the steps. And we'd have to still research those steps to make sure, again, that it's useful and solves a problem, that it's novel, and that it's not obvious. So that's the standard. But you do have to have um, something that doesn't require a person to do. You know, so it used to be somebody would say, okay, the method of making a sandwich and, you know, toast the bread two times and butter on this side. And people were getting all these patents, the method of training a dog with a stick. Now it has to have something that doesn't require the person to do something. You're either patenting the apparatus that has different features, or if you have software like what you talked about, it will be the method of doing that with some type of hardware, you know, some um, processor or something that's doing something to make that software work. So for instance, Instagram the method of looking at pictures uh, from different people all over the world within an app and, you know, the way you scroll or the way you explore. Maybe, it's yeah. Yeah, because when you think of the iPhone, I think they said the iPhone has a thousand plus patents. So 
Wow. I mean, you gotta use your guts. What I what I love about inventions is that people know the patent because everybody's seen a commercial where they say, "Do you have an idea? Get a patent." What people don't know is copyright law, and they don't understand trademarks. And mm -hmm. so, you see, all these people, I get so many, I'm on the internet and social media a lot because I'm collecting evidence, taking screenshots and watching people bury themselves saying, oh, well, I love the name of her podcast. I'm just going to make my logo green or, you know, it doesn't work like that. So you just have to be careful. And when you have an idea, take action, consult with an attorney and say, hey, can I use this name? What's your research showing? And you present what you found to the attorney, we can talk about it because it's better for you to change the name of a product or a service that you're providing before you make a lot of money versus having to pay somebody for using their name. I'd rather you start fresh with something strong that's yours and you feel good about it. And when it comes to trademarks, I know that when some things become so common use, let's say a Kleenex, a, a Band-Aid, a Q-tip, you no longer have that trademark because it's become something that's common use. Does it apply that same way for patents too? And you can speak yeah. on the, um, you know, that common use too, just to kind of break it down to people. Um, so, so no for patents. So patents expire, you know, so you get a patent, um, and you can own it for 20 years. And so once it expires, it's fair game for anybody to make the same thing. Now, trademarks, though, as long as you police and enforce them, you can make sure that you maintain a brand, you know, where people see it as a source identifier. So there's a range of trademarks on the spectrum from strong to weak. So a strong trademark is going to be a word that you create like Google. So you made up that word. That's a strong trademark. And then you go down the spectrum to words that mean something in the dictionary, but they don't mean anything related to your invention. Apple for computer. So we know Apple is a fruit, but it's strong for a computer company because it doesn't mean anything related to computers. But then you may have something that's descriptive, lavender for a soap company. That's going to be a weaker trademark because people use that word to describe products or services, a lavender scent. So it's possible that maybe if you have the evidence, you can prove that people see it as a brand, but it's going to be a weaker trademark and harder to enforce. And then as you go down the spectrum, you can't trademark generic words. So you can't trademark shoes for shoes or computer for computer because the government's not going to give you exclusive rights over a generic word. So what you're referring to are words like escalator and aspirin. They were at one time... Um, trademarks, but that's why you see Kleenex saying Kleenex brand, you know, or Xerox will say, you know, Xerox machine, like they were trying to emphasize even in commercials that, hey, don't just say, pass me a Kleenex, you know, start mm -hmm. using words in a way that it's a brand instead of an adjective or a noun. And so as long as you can enforce your mark to make sure people don't start using it in a way that it means something in the dictionary and it becomes generic, then you can really maintain a trademark. What's impressive about that is you can maintain a trademark as long as you continue to use it. So Coca-Cola has had that name since the 1800s. So long when you're gone, when you think of legacy building, you should be thinking about brands because if your kids keep that business going and they're using that name and their kids and their kids, as long as you maintain the trademark and show that you're using it, every five to 10 years, you get to keep it. So trademarks are valuable too. You don't have to refile every five to 10 years. It'll just no. automatically. No, it's not automatically. You pay a fee and you have to file documents to show them that you're using it. But as okay. long as you continue to use it and you keep up with that, you get to keep the trademark. So mm -hmm. you don't refile the application. You just show them that you're using it. Mm hmm. Okay. I get what you mean. I get what you mean. Mm -hmm. um, when I talked to an attorney, he mentioned that a trademark is essentially an asset for you, the same way you would have your your home as an asset, or you know something else that old that you're you make money off of. That's what you own. You own that trademark, and that's how it um, has a benefit to you. That's right. Yeah, like I said, whatever you can do with real property, you can do with intellectual property. License, assign it, sell it, will it. Um, so you have to start 
thinking about protecting, you know, this type of protection. So, you know, if someone's breaking in to the homes in your neighborhood, you may get a security system in place. Instead of waiting for someone to rob you, you go and protect your house before that happens because you know it can happen. So, you know, someone can steal your intellectual property. So protect it instead of waiting for someone to take it from you and then trying to prove, oh, no, that's mine. You know, that's it's better to, like I said, be more proactive than reactive. And in the long run, it's going to cost you less when you have that protection in advance versus scrambling to get the protection. Mm -hmm. So for the people who are out there that have that latest and greatest million dollar idea, what are your tips for them on pr protecting it and you know the next step actions that they should take? Well, the first thing is you definitely want to research. So you can go to google.com forward slash patents and kind of play around with keywords to see if you can find your invention. If you find something that's identical, you know to stop. It's not patentable. But what I will say is don't be surprised when you find something that's related because that lets you know, hey, other people are trying to solve this same problem too. So that's not surprising. And you want to then if you don't find something identical, schedule a call um, with my law firm. I'd love to work with you all. Evans IP Law is where you can follow me all over social media. And EvansIPLaw.com is where you can find us online. And when you schedule that consultation, we have intake forms that allow you to plug in information about what you found and pictures of the invention if you have them, a description or anything that would help. And then we take the steps from there to then do our professional research and circle back to ensure you understand your options because you can get a patent, but you want to make sure that it's broad enough to get you good protection because you want the patent to be worth more than the piece of paper that it's on. You want to make sure that it's able to be enforced uh, once you get it. So you have an idea, you know, definitely invest in that idea and act on that idea and take action. You don't want to sit and wonder what could have happened because the clock is ticking. And once you make a public disclosure, once you talk about it, once you share it, you use it, you have only one year to file a patent application or it's considered given away. So don't give away your ideas, protect them. Yes, everybody protect those ideas. It could be the next best thing. Yeah. <laughs> now, do you have tips for um, young women of color who are looking to get into your field? Because I, we didn't speak on it, but I'm sure as most STEM fields are, it's not that diverse. You could speak on that a little bit if you um, wanted to share your experience in that area and then, you know, tips, advice for women who are looking to get into a space where they're, they might feel like they're the only one. Yeah, so um, I learned that by the third grade, children permanently lose their interest in STEM. And so I grew up in Houston, like I said, being able to do a lot of projects around my family members that were engineers. And I was always encouraged, even as a young black woman, to do these projects and, you know, pursue science and math. And I just thought everybody was being pushed to do that. Um, so I didn't know anything different. But when my own daughter was in kindergarten, I went to her school in Maryland and said, okay, where's the science club? You know, where are these, where are the robots at the school? And they said, oh no, we don't have any of that. So I actually formed Kid Janeer, a hands-on STEM program. And we provide hands-on programs uh, with engineering disciplines like our Rock the Code video game design class, our chemistry, chemical engineering class, um, our kids in here, Electric City class. So we have a lot of fun. We start as early as five years old. And I bring that up because early intervention and early exposure is key and critical. And so it's my personal mission to expose children at an early age to STEM so that they can take care of us. You know, we have to pour into um, children so that they can grow up and pay it forward as well and out invent and out compete and innovate, you know, compared to other countries. So we know that the U.S. is amazing, you know, and full of ideas and people have so many inventions and things. And we want to encourage more minorities to pursue these types of fields um, so that we can have that rich diversity and continue to innovate. 
I love it. I absolutely love it. That is something that we need everywhere to help spark that curiosity within all of our young ones so that way they can grow up and want to become a patent attorney or an engineer or anything under the sun. <laughs> yes, and that's why I'm so passionate about telling my story and telling people about it because they what research shows is that the reason people usually choose a profession is because someone or something or something happened to inspire them. And children really can't be what they can't see, you know. So if you can say, hey, I am an engineer and, and it wasn't hard and you can do it and I'm a woman and you're a girl, you can still do it. And you have to push people and encourage them. And you'd be surprised what that encouragement and that exposure will do. It's so rewarding uh, to see children do these, you know, take these classes and just the stories I can tell you about how a lot of our kids and their students have actually gone on to college to pursue STEM majors. And it makes nice. me feel so good because they come back and say, remember when I was in kid engineer? I love science because of that. And it makes me feel good because I'm playing a role in creating the next generation of engineers and who knows, maybe a future patent attorney. Nice. How long has that been going on and where is it located? Is it Maryland? It's been going on for 10 years. And yes, we are based in Maryland, um, but we are currently rolling out our online Rock the Code class. So definitely check out kidgeneer.com and subscribe to the newsletter for more information about that. And then if you have at least 10 students, you know, we can actually put together uh, a program as well. Nice. So that way for like someone who personally wants to do it or if it's in their classroom? Yeah, or online, definitely. Gotcha. That's really cool. Definitely people reach out to her. She has all of the resources. Um, within your field, have you found your community of Black women, patent attorneys that you can lean on when times get tough? <laughs> um, it's a small community for sure uh, because you all know being in the STEM field, it's more of a male dominated field anyway. And then, like I said, you're going to go through engineering and then go to law school. So it's even a smaller percent that's going to keep going to law school after that. So um, it's a very small community, but I am very active in the National Bar Association. And there are um, minority organizations uh, where we can bounce ideas off of each other. But um, I have mentors of all races and ethnicities as well. So be open to that uh, because you know, you, you need as much help as you can get in any field. I love it. I absolutely love it. Is there any last tidbits that you'd like to share with the audience? <laughs> well, I just want to thank you, Brittany, for inviting me to tell my story today uh, to your audience. And for those of you who are feeling empowered and STEM powered and you're saying, look, I have a good idea. I have the next best thing and you're not necessarily ready to schedule a consultation, I'd like to encourage you to reach out to my firm and get on our newsletter. You can text Evans IP Law to 33777. And I speak around the country, host a lot of events. So I wanna make sure you all know about that. And you can purchase my books, All About Inventing and All About Trademarks on Amazon or my website, evansiplaw.com forward slash books. And I have a Facebook group as well, all about patents, trademarks, and copyrights, where we talk about daily news, daily IP tips and tricks. And it's a great community of people from all around the world who have ideas and want to bounce things off of each other, want to talk about current events. So I want to invite you all to join my community. And when you're ready, of course, I'm standing by to protect your patents, trademarks, and copyrights. So I'll be looking out for you all to follow me everywhere on social media at Evans IP Law. <laughs> awesome. I'm going to have to join that group so that way I can learn all the little tidbits that I need to know. <laughs> well, you know me, so you're already part of the community. So I'll be looking yes. forward to protecting your intellectual property. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me. I think this was an awesome conversation. And I, even having that interest in patent law, I've never talked to a patent attorney. So this was a first for me, getting to know a little bit about your, the ins and outs of what you do. So I, I enjoyed it completely. <laughs> Thank you. It's a fun feel. It's very rewarding. 
and it's exciting. And I encourage all engineers and those with STEM um, degrees and people who qualify, look into the patent bar. And I'm happy if you have any other questions, please reach out and let's schedule some time to talk because we always need good patent attorneys because people are always inventing. Um, so it's a good recession proof type of job because when things happen, people start innovating. They want to find a solution and they have to protect it. So think about that and consider being a patent attorney. <laughs> you have a lot to think about, ladies, sisters, fellas, whoever is tuning in. She has dropped a lot of knowledge on you. This has been another episode of the STEM Powered Women podcast. My name is Brittany A.J. Mariki. You can follow us at The Sisters in STEM and check out sistersinstem.org. I look forward to seeing you on the next one. And remember, you've got this, sis. Bye.